Lily Pilly Restaurant is in the heart of the rocks in Sydney. Come with us on Dining Down Under as we search the back lanes to find it. Welcome to another episode of Dining Down Under. I'm Vic Cherikoff. Benjamin Christie. And Mark McClaskey. We're cooking recipes today inspired from Lily Pilly at the Rocks, or Lily Pilly on the Rocks, or in the Rocks. It's a great location, Vic. It's actually surrounded or located behind a whole host of international restaurants. And the Rocks is the oldest part of Sydney. It's, uh, it's typically, uh, I mean, the, the buildings there typically have this ancient sandstone, in fact, convict quarried convict quarried stone. Well, it's where they first came across with the first fleet. Exactly, so exactly. And so there's a lot of seafarers there had, um, uh, had their homes, so your little terraces is a great place. There's even a restaurant down there which has a tall ship in the middle of it. Ah, is that right? Okay. Lily Pilly at the Rocks is interesting also because it's Aboriginal run. We have a lot of Aboriginal cultural representation there as well in terms of didge players, didgeridoo players, um, storytellers, a whole host. So the Aboriginal culture is, it's a great place to go, in fact, to experience Aboriginal culture right in the heart of Sydney. Benjamin, what are you cooking, mate? I'm doing a rainforest lime and macadamia nut pudding. Okay. So it's going to have strong citrus notes with the butteriness of the macadamia nuts. Oh, nice, nice, that's great. The rainforest lime, well, we'll talk about the ingredients a little later. Mark, what are you cooking? Well, Vic, I'm going to start off by cooking a comfy. Um, the interesting thing about comfy is in the olden days, well, not so long ago, they're still doing it as well, they used to store it in a jar just like this. Mm -hmm. It preserves quite well and stays under the layer of its own fat. Which cuts out the oxygen and you end up with a long life on... On meat? On pretty much anything. The traditional way of cooking or the traditional use of it is duck. We're doing um, a pork hock that's wrapped in paper bark. We're going to be using the Australian rice grass and a few other ingredients. Okay, so pork hock is, is I mean, you're cooking it slow so it's tender, fall off the bone. That's right, lots of gelatinous flavours. Excellent, okay. And my dish, lastly, I'm cooking uh, a dish certainly from Lily Pilly on the, on the uh, rocks. We're cooking crocodile. And uh, crocodile is a... Um, a, a, an interesting white meat, a little bit like fish and chicken in flavour. This is a section of the tail and we'll be uh, cooking that off in just a minute. But at the moment, have a look at the dishes inspired by this particular restaurant, Lily Pilly on the Rocks in Sydney. Lily Pilly is unique in that it's Aboriginal owned and run and you'll find it up on what they call the Nurse's Walk, just off George Street. Auntie Beryl turns crocodile hunter and knocks up crumbed crop meat scallops. They get deep fried and the excess oil is drained away. The cooked crocodile pieces are served with a mescaline salad of fresh greens and carrot spears. Crispy kumara provides that all important crunch. A mayonnaise flavoured with Oz lemon finishes the plate. The marinated kangaroo fillet is pocketed and garlic stuffed in. The roux is then flame grilled to seal in the flavours and give it the barbecue grill marks. You can see just how lean the meat is with absolutely no body fat. The fillet is finished off for about 12 minutes in a hot oven and then rested as usual to keep it juicy. Many of Lily Pilly's customers are Aborigines who come in from all over the country and then recommend the place to friends. They enjoy the generous serves of the game meats, which are obviously traditional foods and are still highly prized. These meats include not only crocodile and kangaroo, but also emu, wallaby, magpie goose, wild duck, barramundi and other seafood. We seem to forget that all sorts of fish, and as well as shellfish like oysters and mussels, and crustaceans including yabbies and lobsters, these were all once only Aboriginal foods, and they were very important sources of protein. 
They were often cooked to perfection over an open fire in a ground oven, and they were commonly eaten along with fruit. So meat and fruit was a combination that really forms the basis of Aboriginal cuisine in some parts, just like the bush tomatoes here that Auntie Beryl's adding to the kangaroo. The dessert is a pyramid of ice cream made up of three layers of different flavours. Here it has kwandong, macadamia nut and rye berry flavours. The pyramid gets finished with a drizzle of a semi-sweet Davidson plum sauce, which is contrasted with mango syrup swirled around the plate. It provides another flavour and its striking colour is visually appealing. Just the dessert will make your visit to Lily Pilly Restaurant an experience. What I'm doing here is I've got the pork. I'm going to turn it into a confit. As we discussed before, confit means to be cooked in its own juices and stored its, in its own juices under a layer of fat. With this pork hock, I've started off by wrapping it with some paper bark. The paper bark enhances the flavour. It gives it a subtle smoky flavour. To contrast the smoky flavour, I'm going to use some aniseed myrtle. It's going to sprinkle a little bit of aniseed myrtle on there. You can use Egyptian aniseed, star anise. You can even throw a bit of fennel in there for extra flavour. I'm sure back in the European days they would have used fennel for their aniseed flavours. Dill, it's got a little bit of aniseed flavour as well. So that's coming along nicely. We're going to add some of this stock. What the stock's going to do is start to break down the fibres of the meat, slow cook it. So what we do is we'll tip the stock in there and we're going to close the barbecue and create a convection way of cooking. Cooking this slowly, about 150 degrees for about, so let's say, three hours or so. The best way to test it is just give it a bit of a pinch. If the meat comes away from the bone, it's ready. If it's still clinging, just give it a little bit longer. Check it every half an hour. Moving over here to, the, to my um, little pot, we've got a bit of rice in there. I've, what I've done is I've put the brown rice in early. That takes the longest to cook. So I've cooked that for about five to six minutes. That's coming along nicely. It's about halfway cooked. So I'm going to add some of the Australian rice grass. This Australian rice, gr rice grass has been likened to wild rice. So we're going to add that, stir it around a bit, and come back in a few minutes. And guys, what are you doing over there? Thanks for that, Mark. I'm, uh, I'm about to prepare the crocodile. In fact, Benjamin, you've got a bit more to do. I'll let you uh, lead off from there. I'm going to start by creaming the butter. And so I'm going to add in some brown sugar into the butter and let that cream. That'll take a few minutes to come together. While that's happening, I'll prepare the baking dish. I've got a ceramic dish for the pudding and I'm gonna start by putting a bit of butter in the bottom just so it's easy to get out next time. And start by layering the sliced desert limes in the bottom. So that takes a few moments and we'll evenly spread those out. Now the, the butter's starting to get creamed. I'll just slow that down and I'll add in an egg and then I'll this, add in two actually. These uh, creek limes are interesting. I mean you don't see limes used very often with the, uh, the whole skin and all because this is literally the whole lime just sliced. Although there's a lot of oils and aromatics in the skin, you can still eat the whole thing and uh, it just gives you a concentrated lime flavour, unlike the Tahitian lime. It's not too bitter either. No. So we'll just incorporate that now and then I'll add the flour and milk in. Mate, while you're mixing and stirring that, could yep. I perhaps uh, drag uh, our viewers away just to have a little look at this crocodile? This is going to take a little bit of, uh, of preparation just in the tying and the fiddle. Now, I've used a piece of tail here, and the tail meets... Uh, I've simply... How long did you have to wrestle a crocodile, mate? Wrestle a crocodile? <laughs> mate, I've got a big knife. It's not a problem. <laughs> and most people have seen Croc Dundee anyway. It's dead easy these days, isn't it? But you slice the crocodile. Um, you can actually, if you don't get crocodile or alligator, you can use uh, maybe even a turkey fillet, for example. Now, the flavouring here is quite simple. It's a sprinkle of salt. It's a saltwater crocodile, so you need the salt. Enhance the flavour. 
and wattle seed goes on dry. And this is one of the few times that you actually use wattle seed dry because normally it needs boiling to soften it. All right. Now I could have even used a bit of paper bark here to save the mess on the board, but the long and short of it is I have my crocodile made quite brown with the wattle seed. Now this is the part that uh, gets interesting because it affects the presentation, the ultimate presentation of the dish. And I'm cooking a, basically making almost a, a log of the crocodile and a little bit more. So it's a few pinches. Then you use the paper bark and literally just tie it up like you tie up your Christmas parcels. And there it is. Now I made the mistake because I hadn't prepared this dish for some time prior to the show of actually putting that in the microwave and cooking it. And what ended up happening was um, it jumped out, split open, and effectively the muscle of the crocodile straightened out. And so you end up with the open fillet again. So you do need to tie this up in plastic wrap and then tie it up again with string. So while I'm doing that, back to you, Benjamin. I'm just cutting up the macadamia nuts here, just roughly cutting. And then I'm gonna incorporate them into the cake, the pudding mix, I should say. And you wanna keep it a little bit moist. You don't want it to, to dry up either. So I'll just put these in. Mark, you're pretty right out there. Yeah, the comfy's coming along nicely, Vic. The, the juices are starting to absorb. The meat's starting to slightly come away from the bone. And you can really smell the paper bark from the barbecue. Excellent. So the pork's cooking away nicely. We can really smell the flavours coming through. You guys at home can't. We really feel sorry for you, but, uh, you know, tune in and taste the flavours. So we'll open this up. It's bubbling away nicely. The meat, as I said, feel it. It's coming away from the bone. It's so tender. It really is tender. It's so juicy. So we're going to take that out the front, remove the paper bark, and we're going to start removing the meat from the bone and showing you how to store a confit. That's great. Out it comes steaming. Let me show you the... Um... There we go. You okay there for a while? Yeah, man, I might just keep going with this. Oh, no, please do. Ugh. So there we go. What we're going to do is remove the paper bark. Look at that. How good does that look? So the paper bark's also helped hold in the juices. It has helped hold in the juices. It does look a little bit messy, but, mate, the flavour makes up for it. It really does. So what we're going to do... You can just grab a knife and here. And because you're working the meat off the bone, it's no big deal to remove the paper bark? It isn't. It really isn't. So we just pull away the fat there. Look at that meat, how easily it comes away from the bone. It's great, isn't it? That's nice and tender. So it just oh. falls away. Oh. You could eat it with a fork. Do you want a taste? Absolutely. There we go. Thanks. Oh, you want some, Ben? Mm. Can't say no. So there we go. We keep mm. removing the meat from the bone there, just pulling it away. There we go. So, so in this instance, the paper bark is actually not imparting any flavour of its own, it's simply used as a functional material to hold the juices in. That's right. And it's important also to remember that if you were, for example, to use um, aluminum or aluminium or tin foil and cover the whole tray, you've got a problem because you don't want the aluminium to touch the fat of the meat. So put in a barrier somewhere, either a greaseproof paper um, or paper bark in this instance, because the aluminium can react with the food, dissolve in there, and you, uh, we're all quite aware of Alzheimer's disease these days with the high aluminium intake. Definitely. And the meat's come away from the bone there nicely. We've got the fat on the paper bark over here, and we've got a bone for the dog a little bit later. That's the way. <laughs> so there we go. And as I said before, this is how it, how it um, looks at the end. We've got the juices here. Just to put the meat into a jar, tip the juices in, the fat will set, and that can store for about, what, three or four weeks, Vic? Oh, easily, easily. In the old way, old days, they'd either put that in an ice flow or bear it in a well mm. just for the cold of the water, and it would last quite some time. And with time. comfy, it's used quite heavily in fine dining restaurants, isn't it? Benjamin? Just finishing off the pudding mix now. A bit of rainforest herbs. I'm just going to mix those in and pour it into the pudding mould. 
So this is a really, this is a really simple dish, but really, uh, really easy. Pudding is just going to. Uh, I mean, it's an English staple in a way. It's an English based des uh, dessert. Something for winter, maybe. Something for winter, although with the tartness of the limes and the um, uh, lemon myrtle flavours in there as well, <coughs> we're actually putting the light aromatics in it, which will really convert a heavy winter dish into probably more of a, a summer summer dish as well. Now, 180 for 30 minutes. Well, that's the grill, and I want to put it in there. Wouldn't cook too quickly, would it, mate? Yeah, well, the top would do, all right. <laughs> so, a bit of a souffle. And that's that. There How are you go. going, Vic? Okay, my crocodile. I'll make this snappy. <clears throat> um, <laughs> oh, dear sorry, me. fellas. Gets worse. It does. Now, a couple of uh, things I just mentioned. This is the little parcel I prepared. You can tie the string either around the paper bark or around the plastic wrap, uh, the cling film on, on this side. Um, the important thing is, is to make the ties fairly close uh, because the crocodile will try and get away as you cook it. The muscle will try and straighten out and it'll break through the paper bark. So it's important to really make that quite a nice, neat little parcel. Now, the way to cook that is either poaching it in a, a pot of boiling water. There it'll take about five to ten minutes to cook. But a much easier way is to cook it in the microwave, cook it on high for about five minutes, let it rest for five minutes, turn it over and again cook it for another three minutes and it's done. Crocodile does need to be cooked medium rare um, and typically it's supplied frozen which also knocks out, um, well it's part of the process of, uh, of, of selling healthy meat. With the resting process, Vic, what, what does that do to crocodile? I know you have to do it with red meats just to, to release the blood, but what's the effect on crocodile? No, the resting here is important because of microwave cooking. It, you really need the microwaves to start penetrating through the meat itself to cook through to the centre. So if a you delayed want, reaction? Well, you cook a little bit with the microwave, you let it rest, the heat keeps cooking even though the microwave's not working. Upending it and cooking it basically finishes it and averages out, it, average out the microwave exposure through the whole meat. What you're going to end up with uh, in fact, the next stage is to chill that. Take that out and uh, once it's cooked fully, put it in the refrigerator overnight and uh, you end up with this particular product here. It's literally like a processed chicken in a way. Now we're actually again using the paperback, like Mark, using the paperback purely for a functional role so that we don't have to go to using an expensive microwave proof plastic doesn't matter, we're not having the plastic contact our food, and so we're not eating those carcinogenic compounds that can do us harm from our petrochemical world. Looks like a substitute to the Sunday roast. A substitute for the Sunday roast. In actual fact, what we're doing here is retaining our little piece of meat, it's a, and we'll find that as we cut it, we end up with oh, a really nice that. piece of meat. Excellent. We'll, dish, we'll prepare that dish up. So just to summarise our meal for today, will be a wattle crocodile salad with a lime and ryeberry jam to finish, pork and forest anise confit with brown rice, bunya nut and Australian rice grass. And the dessert is the rainforest lime and macadamia nut pudding. Right then, start plating up. I'm just finishing mine. We've got our guest, Nicola, sit seated already. I'm just putting some ginger sauce on top now from the town of Budrum in uh, North Queensland. Australian ginger, what else? I'm uh, hightailing it. How are you guys doing? Not too far behind you there, Vic. Not too far, okay. We've got a letter from a, uh, a viewer as well. Great. It's always good to get feedback. The nutty wattle seed crusting the poached crocodile works really well for both flavour and visuals. And the tart fruit jam is sensational with crocodile. Mark's pork hock with Australian rice grass and bunya nuts and snow peas scented with wild herbs is a must try recipe. And this wild lime pudding may look a bit ordinary, but it's filled with a tangy lime syrup and given some cream or sour cream, well, I could eat the lot myself. Do you know that you can't outrun a crocodile going in a straight line? So if you're ever in a situation a crocodile's actually chasing you, you want to run that way, because their brains are so small they can't sort of move legs at different paces. 
So they can only run in a straight line, but they can outrun you in a straight line, no problem at all. There's a little bit of trivia today. That and other recipes that you saw on this show will be on the website. Let me read a letter while you have a taste. We don't expect you to eat that whole thing, Nicola. It's just a taste from the side. Give it a fair go, though. We have a letter from James McClarty from Auckland in New Zealand. Dear guys, I love the show and I just recently got a hold of some paper bark. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but the, the stuff seems to stick to whatever I'm cooking. What should I do to avoid this? Presentation is everything. Well, that's true. The trick with paper bark is when you peel it, look at the two sides. One will be stringy, one won't. Make a gap between the paper bark and whatever you're cooking. Yep, yep, okay. The other thing is, if you do get a few little uh, fibres sticking there, don't worry about it. It's only fibre, it's good for you. Join us next week as we turn more international cuisine upside down on Dining Down Under.